A life built on the Lord, right? Stand with me this morning. So good to see you. We're glad that you're here. We're starting a new series called You Are Made to Soar. Let's do a little uh, rehearsing here. I was made to soar. Can you say that with me? Here we go. I was made to soar. You did so much better than that first service. Let me tell you, you're really good. Let's do it again. Here we go. I was made to soar. Now look at your neighbor and say, and so were you. You were really made to soar. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together today. We love you. We praise you. Let your word go forth with clarity and passion and purpose. Do what you sent your word to do today. And we give you praise and glory in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Turn to your neighbors. I'm glad you're here today. The book of Deuteronomy, Old Testament, chapter 32, if you will follow along with me, I'm going to begin at verse number 9. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone did lead him. We, we have some biblical imagery here. And there's a purpose for that, much like the parables. The Lord uses earthly illustrations so we can get some heavenly truths. Sometimes we just don't get it. Have you ever been to the place where the Lord was speaking and you said, man, I just don't get it. And the Lord kind of gets it down where we can understand it. He, he gets the feed down on my level and your level so we can kind of understand what he's saying. And that's what he's doing here. He's giving us some illustration. And he compares his leadership and he, he is using the illustration of an eagle. And if you came in this morning, you saw an eagle's nest out in the foyer that some of the guys built. And one of the things about soaring is one of the difficult aspects of soaring is just the liftoff. Did you, do you know that most of the fuel used in a plane is takeoff and getting to altitude? I mean, just this thing about gravity. We, we, we got to push against it. Uh, NASA says about 80, 85 percent of all the fuel used in a rocket is just to get the escape of gravity, get it up into orbit, and it uses most of it just to do that. And let me tell you, just to get you to soar, me to soar, I want to tell you, liftoff is hard. And, and, and I explain it this way, it's kind of like a diet. Have you ever tried to start a diet? You know, just the start is difficult. I mean, you get up, you have a couple of pieces of toast, you get some orange juice, and you know, by noon you have a tuna fish sandwich, by three it's two snicker bars, and then it's malts and things like that. I mean, it goes downhill really fast. But there, there is this thing about, you know, getting started, getting, getting the lift off, you know, escaping that inertia. In 1962, uh, Robert F. Kennedy at Rice University, thousands of people there, he's given a speech. And in that speech in 62, he said, we choose the moon. So he made the commitment that America would land a man on the moon in that decade. And we know by 1969, there was a man on the moon. But he said in 62, he said, we will choose the moon. Then he went to, and this is very interesting, he went to Werner von Braun, who was the leading rocket scientist in the entire world. And he said, okay, I made the statement, we're going to go to the moon. He said, we don't have a rocket that will reach the moon. He said, can we develop a rocket that will reach the moon? And this is what von Braun said to President Kennedy. He said, we can do it if we will it, only if we will it. How many of you know if you will something, things can happen in your life? Now, what's interesting also, when Von Braun died at the cemetery where he is buried, he has a huge headstone, and on that headstone is a scripture. It is actually Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament is the work of his hand. Isn't that amazing? That as we have liftoff, if we leave the surly bonds of gravity in the earth, as we soar in our life, then, then we do have to escape that inertia. And everybody has it. Let me tell you, just that beginning is absolutely huge. And, and getting started is hard and it's difficult. Um, to soar, we have to defy some laws. 
It's called the law of gravity, this thing that kind of keeps us bound. But there are laws that are higher than the laws of gravity, if you can believe that. It's the law of lift. There are some aerodynamics that happen here, and we can have the law of lift. And listen, if you're in an airplane, you love the law of lift because it keeps you up. And as we soar and as we fly and as we move forward, then the law of lift overcomes the law of gravity, but you have to keep that law intact and going. So, you know, there are some things that we can identify that holds us down. And everybody's got them. I mean, me, you, the person sitting next to you, we all have things that kind of keep us down. I believe God wants you to soar higher than you've ever soared before. And I believe that we as a church, you individually, us as families, parents, in your business, your entrepreneurship, I believe you can get to a level you've never been to before in your life. And, and it's beyond age, it's, it's beyond you know, location. So we need to be a church, we need to be a group, we need to be a person that believes that you can soar higher than you've ever been before. How many of you believe that today? I mean, I'm a believer, not a doubter. So what could be some of the things that would hold us down? Well, let me give you one. The first one is we have to overcome our own insecurities. And uh, you have some insecurities. I do too. And our insecurities can really have us to question our own identity. Listen, we live in a world today, I have never been in a time where identity has been such a big thing. I mean, we don't know who we are sexually. We don't know who we are in gender. We don't know who we are in race, and this is pervasive in our culture today. You know, am I a man, am I a woman? You know, am I this, am I that? So one of the things we have to really face is this identity problem, and a lot of the identity problem is from our own insecurity. Now this is not something new. I mean, this is thematic even through the Bible. Remember when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush? And he, he's getting him to go back to lead the children of Israel out of the land of bondage or Egypt. And the first thing that Moses really begins to dialogue with God when God says, I want you to go back. Moses says, who am I? Who am I? I I'm having an identity crisis. Who, who am I that I could do this? Or who am I that I'm qualified to do this? And so the Lord uh, you know, is encouraging him to go on. Moses gives him all the excuses why he can't. Who am I? And then Moses switches the flip here, and, and he says, well, Lord, who are you? Who am I? Who are, who are you? And the Lord says, I am that I am. When you figure out who he is, you'll get a good indication who you are. Because our identity sometimes is not who we are, it's who he is. And then we begin to figure out who we are. And that response helped Moses to move forward. Gideon had the same thing. Remember the Midianites, they're covering the land of Egypt. I mean, of, of Israel. They've come out of Egypt. Now they're in their own land. A few years later, uh, they're overtaken by another country and other people, the, the Midianites. And now Gideon, this guy, the Lord speaks to him, and he says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor. And I'm sure Gideon looked over his shoulder and said, are, who are you talking to here? I mean, you can't be talking to me. And the Lord said, you are a mighty man of valor. And, and do you remember Gideon's response? He, he said, wait a minute, Lord. He said, you may not know this, but he said, our tribe is the least in all Israel. And my father's family, our clan, is the least in the tribe. And I'm the least in my father's house. You can't be talking to me. Surely you've got to be talking to somebody else. So Gideon saw himself as this. This was his identity. But God saw his identity as this. Moses sees his identity as this. God sees his identity as this. Now listen very closely. Sometimes we try to achieve our identity when in the kingdom of God, we should receive our identity. You, you just can't achieve it. Sometimes you just receive it, and you receive it by faith. Now, let me give you a classic example. This is Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. So in his writings, this is in Philippians chapter 3, I believe. In his writings, he begins to say, are they Jews? I'm a Jew. Are, are they of Israel? I'm, I'm of Israel. Are they Hebrews? I'm a Hebrew. Do they keep the law? I keep the law. Matter of fact, he said concerning the law, he said blameless. Circumcised the eighth day. Tribe of Benjamin. 
I mean, he's saying, this is what I've achieved. This is who I am. But then in verse number eight of Philippians three, he said, I count all these things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. I count them as rubbish dung that I may win Christ. He said, okay, these are the things I've achieved. But he said, listen, my identity really is found in the knowledge and the person of Jesus Christ. So he says, I've achieved this, but I receive this because this is who I am. And that's very important because this is what's going to happen. Listen closely. The culture will tell you who you are. The movies will tell you who you are. The influencer on the internet will tell you who you are. Your friend may tell you who you are. Let God tell you who you are. That's important because when we don't get the proper perspective the enemy will tell you something that you are not and later you'll regret it happens every day matter of fact we have a culture pushing you to become something you should not be romans chapter 8 this is verse 31 32 what then shall we say to these things If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Verse 37, for we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You you say, well, wait a minute, pastor. I don't feel like a conqueror. Hey, lay your feelings aside. That's what he said. He, He said, this is your identity. This who you are. Don't get caught up in your own insecurities. Don't get caught up with what somebody else says. You have to realize this is who you are, and we have to take that by faith. Here's the second thing very quickly. To soar, we have to overcome skepticism and criticism. Do not let someone else's view, their criticism, pull you down to their level. We've heard this for years. You don't have to put a lid on a bucket of crabs every time a crab tries to get out the other crab reaches up and grabs him and pulls him down how many of you know some crabby people (laughs) quit looking around i'm telling you there's there's people that are always going to pull you down let me tell you why they don't want you to soar you make them look bad God wants you to soar. He he wants you to be more than you've ever been. He wants you to be at a higher place, a a, a higher vision, a a higher plateau in him. Because we were were made to be seated in heavenly places. You you weren't made to be down here. You were made to be up here. And if you don't watch it, people try to keep you down here. They'll pull you down to a level that you should not be on. Can I hear an amen to that? And so what we're doing, we're saying, okay, I'm meant to soar. How do I soar and what keeps me from soaring? So we have to realize that people can say some things. They can do some things. And we've all experienced that. Robert Fulton, who really uh, developed the first successful steam engine, they said when he was going to demonstrate that, you know, put it in a boat, paddle wheel, steam, steam engine thing. And so a, a lot of people called it Fulton's Folly. Have you ever heard that term? Fulton's Folly. So he, he's got it in the river. They're, they're going to start the steam engine. And so as he gets ready to start, this is what people are saying. He'll never get it started. He's never going to get it started. He's never going to get it started. Never going to get it started. And then when it did go, you know what they said? He'll never get it stopped. He'll never get it stopped. Never get it stopped. So I'll guarantee you, there's going to be people around you who will give you all kinds of reasons why you can't, you want, you shouldn't. And you don't listen to them. Listen, you listen to what God said about you. You listen to what the Holy Spirit is speaking in your heart, your life, you know, developing you, calling you, wooing you. Here, here's another one. Uh, Milton Wright, a church bishop, the Brethren Church. So he made this statement, you know, many years ago. He said, men will never fly because flying is reserved for the angels. Here's the problem. He had two sons named Orville and Wilbur Wright. And their dad said, men will never fly because flight is reserved for the angels. How many of you glad that he didn't keep his sons from soaring? But here's something that's also amazing. In 1878, while the kids were small, he brought them home a toy. And the toy was a little wooden helicopter that was powered by a rubber band. 
So you take the top and you spin it till the rubber band gets tight. I, I think you get the picture. And you let it go and it flies for a little bit and then it falls. 1878, he brought that home to his kids. I'm wondering that about 23 years later, if that wasn't the spark that helped them think about flight. And in 1903, they took the first, what we call first flight, and if you listen to everybody, even the people of your own family, isn't that amazing? People in your family can be crabby. <laughs> Try to pull you down. So sometimes it's not the people out there that give us trouble. Sometimes it's the people in here that gives us trouble. You see, there was, there was a guy in the Bible named Joseph. At age 17, he began to have some dreams, shared it with his family, his brothers and his dad. You know what? They attacked the dream. But aren't you glad he didn't give up on the dream? God was speaking to his life. God began to lead him and guide him. And, and even through the difficulty with his own family, I mean, this is horrendous, but God still used him. This young man soared. He led the greatest dynasty in the world at that time. He was, if you will, the leader of the entire nation of Egypt. See, God can give you dreams. He can speak to your life. But if you don't watch it, somebody will try to be a dream killer in your life. They'll keep you from soaring. They'll try to pull you down, keep you from flight. How many of you know you were made to fly? You were made to soar. I don't have to wonder that. I just read to you, God said, this is the way I'm leading you. This is the illustration I'm giving to you. You were made for that. And every person here, bar none, you've had somebody try to say something to you or do something to you to try to keep you down. It could be a parent, a mom, a dad, a brother, sister, a co-worker could be somebody that you admired and they're going to say things like this. You'll never get that done. You'll never accomplish that. Or you'll never amount to anything. I want to tell you something. God meant for you to soar. And you cannot listen to that. You cannot listen to that criticism, that negativity, because it will keep you from soaring if you try to let it get down in your spirit. Can I hear an amen? Amen. You know, this is what the Bible says in Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like what? Eagles. 23 times in the Bible, the Lord refers to eagles. And he keeps giving us this illustration. He's saying, listen, I want you to be like an eagle. I want you to rest. I want you to run. I want you to soar like an eagle. Now, if you've been in Oklahoma very long, especially the last few days, how many of you know the hot winds can blow around here? I'm not talking about your neighbor blowing hot air. I'm talking about the winds. I mean, they can blow a lot of hot air. One of the things we have to realize is that your adversity may be the thing that causes you to soar. If you go out and you watch the birds, the, the eagles, the buzzards, whatever, a lot of times you never see them flap their wings. You know what they're doing? They just have them extended out. I, I think most airports, most uh, planes will take off in the wind. You know why? Because it gives you lift. It, it overcomes that law of gravity. It's the thing that resist gives you the lift. And, and this is very thematic through the Bible. It's the very thing that is the adversity, the challenge, the difficulty that causes you to soar, and you would never soar without it. A young man by the name of David going to the Valley of Elah fighting a giant, it was that adversity that propelled him to soar. Without the giant, we may never hear about David. So you look at the Bible. Listen, every miracle starts with the problem. And you can soar in the adverse winds. And, and this is amazing. You know, those eagles get up there. When that wind's blown against them, they just adjust their wings. And they can just soar. And, and, and they can just, you know, move those feathers. Isn't it amazing what they can do? I mean, they are fearfully and wonderfully made like us. And they're soaring, and you rise against the current, and you lift, and that which comes against you, don't let it knock you down, soar over it. L allow it to lift you up to a higher place, a higher plane. Uh, you may know this from history. Benjamin Franklin wanted our national emblem to be a turkey. Oh, you're laughing like me, right? 
Uh, it's really true. Franklin wanted us to have a national emblem of a turkey. You know, if I was in the military and going to battle with a turkey on my shoulder, I, I don't know. It just doesn't sound the same, does it? But uh, I, I'm glad they, they didn't go with that. They, they did the eagle. I, I want to give you very quickly just about four things that we really need to soar. And this goes in with what the Lord said about the eagle. To soar, we need the right environment, we need the right examples, we need the right equipping, we need the right encouragement. You'll understand this when we you know, close this out. Um, you know, that, that eagle, that, that pair, they, they create the right environment for their eaglets, right examples, right equipment, right encouragement. And, and if you want to be an eagle, you've got to quit hanging out with the turkeys. I mean, turkeys can fly, but they fly low, and they don't fly for very long. Most of the time, they spin on the ground. So if you're an eagle, and you're saying, I want to be an eagle, then lose the turkey syndrome and, and begin to say, i got to be in the right environment. And all these things here that I've listed will help us to soar and really become fruitful in our life, providing the seedbed, the example, the equipment that we need to sprout, prosper, and to soar. Now, one of the things that I think we really need to get on our spirit, that fruitfulness is disruptive. Say that with me. Fruitfulness is disruptive. Because when you break up the fallowed ground, so let's be very biblical here. If you break up the fallowed ground, that's disruptive. If you sow seed in the ground, that's disruptive. Because that seed is going to sprout and the roots are going to go down into the earth and disrupt the earth. So fruitfulness is disruptive. My, my boys have been fruitful. I have five grandkids. When they come to my house, it is disruptive. <laughs> it's really true. I, I said to the early service this morning, sometimes Carrie and I don't know if we pick it up or we get the garden rake and rake it up. I mean, you look at our house, there's stuff strung everywhere, toys and things, and, and, and it's just d disruptive. When, when they leave at 6 or 7, well, we just go to bed. I'm tired. <laughs> but fruitfulness is disruptive. And if you think about this, Abraham at 100, Sarah at 90, that was disruptive. I, children are for young people. Not hundred-year-old people. Are you thinking about this? Now, Carrie and I are not a hundred yet, but it's still disruptive when, with grandkids. What if you have a baby at a hundred and Sarah's 90? That's disruptive. And you're, you're at Homeland, you've got the little one in the cart, and you're going through Homeland, and they say, is that your great-grandchild? No. <laughs> is that your grandchild? No. That's her baby. And, and maybe Abraham went through like, oh, yeah, 100 years old. <laughs> Got the stuff, right? But fruitfulness really is disruptive. And God is calling us what? To be fruitful and to soar. Now, you think about this. Let, let's go back to what the Lord is saying. This is how I led you. This is the, this is the picture I want you to get. Those nests out there are about six, six and a half feet wide. They're, you know, three, four feet deep. They use them year after year. It takes them months to build it. They're not just little bitty bird's nests. How many of you know they're massive? Big branches, big sticks. They have to survive the storm up in the big trees, the big crags of the rock. I mean, 50 miles, 60, 70 mile hour wind. They build something that's stable because they're going to put their babies there. And those eagles, they mate for life. And their courtship is in the air. Don't you love it? You and I have been made to be seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We have a courtship that's in the air. And then she builds her nest. She lays her eggs. She gets that nest all ready, gets it comfortable. She'll even pull out her own feathers and down to line that nest for her eggs. And don't you love it? Those little eaglets aren't hatched on the ground. They're hatched in the heavenlies. Hatched in the heavenlies. And those eaglets aren't very, they're not very pretty. I mean, they're googly-eyed, big beaks, weird-looking wings, a little bit of gray down there. I wonder in the spirit, 
if we look a little googly-eyed sometimes. But the Lord loves us. And, and these eagles that mate for life, they'll go out and get the food for their babies because they cannot supply it on their own. How many of you know we're totally dependent upon God? You can't save yourself. These little eaglets have the food brought in and they eat and they eat and they grow and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. The Bible says that she, here's the word, hovers over them. She, she gets on the edge of the nest and she flaps her wings and said, babies, this is the way it's done. This is what you do. This is the example. I'm equipping you. I'm showing you. And then as they grow, the Bible says she stirs up the nest. What, what does that mean? Well, it means she reaches down with her beak and she begins to throw out the feathers and the moss and the leaves and she hooks up the sticks and those little eagles say, well, it's not as comfortable here as it used to be. It's not as comfortable as it was before. What is she doing? I want you to become what you were born to become. You're not made for the nest. You're made to soar. And she says, okay, babies, this is the way it's done. Watch mama, watch me. And then some will mature and they'll, they'll begin to fly and it says she bears them on her wings, so she puts them on the wings, she takes them for a flight, and they go out, and she says, okay, this is what it's like, baby. Takes them back to the nest, and maybe one by one, they, they begin to soar, and they begin to fly. But every once in a while, there may be one or two, for fear or whatever, they just don't get out of the nest, they don't fly. And this is what she does. I mean, this is documented. She'll put that baby, she'll put that little eaglet that has matured that should be out of the nest she'll put that baby on her back and take it for a flight bring it back take it for a flight bring it back and then if it doesn't fly she will roll that baby off of her back how would you like to be that baby mama what in the world are you doing to me do you know they can soar 10 to 20 thousand feet in the air and here that baby is in a free fall, and sometimes it's like dads taking their boys to learn how to swim. Boom, here it is, son, swim. But many times they will spread their wings and they will fly, but sometimes they won't. But she has the ability, before they hit the ground, she can tuck her wings and dive, snatch that baby out of the air, and say, maybe next time, baby. You'll get it. Are you listening? This is what the Lord said. That's how I lead you. Have you ever been in a free fall? Have you ever felt like you weren't going to make it? You're fixing to smack at the bottom. You're not going to survive. God, this trial is so difficult. This is so horrible. I don't think I'm going to survive. And all of a sudden, his grace, his mercy, his provision, his miracle working power comes down and snatches us up and puts us back in a safe place. And he says, maybe next time, baby, you'll get it. Wow. That's how God does us. That's how God leads us. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Mike, you don't know. I'm in a free fall. I've done some horrible things. Well, join the club because we all have. But you serve a God that loves you so much. He can pick you up in your fall and put you back in a safe place. Show you how to soar again in your life. We said again. The Lord said, this is how I lead you. You're the apple of my eye. And then he, I think, would say this to all of us. You were made to soar. You were made to soar.